Uh, my name is Rickard, and I'm the author of Scholarship. And I'm here to t t today to talk about how you can test stateful systems with Scholarship. First, I'd like to ask you, uh, how many of you have ever used Scholarship in one way or another? Oh, that's great to see. Uh, and that's good, because I will have a very quick uh, and brief Scholarship intro. Um, This is a sort of a canonical uh, Scholarship uh, example. Uh, Scholarship is about property-based testing. So instead of writing, in, writing examples of how your program behave for certain inputs, you write an, an abstract property that that's, uh, should describe the functionality. So in this case, we, have, uh, we want to test the reverse method of the list. And, uh, we just say that for any list, if you call reverse twice, you should get the same, uh, same list back. And this, this property, of course, don't specify the, the reverse method completely, but it sort of captures one, uh, one property uh, that, you want to, that you want to hold for your implementation. And Properties can be things like this, that the, the, the plus uh, operator should commute, or that your compress method should actually make things smaller, uh, or that if you encode something and then decode it, you should get the, the original content back. And what Scholarship provides is a way to, if we go back here, is a way to, it provides three things. Uh, in, the, in this example, it's, it comes up with with list of integers completely on its own. So it has support for, for generating uh, ordinary Scala types. But it also has a small language for defining your own data generators. So you can say things about any type if you define uh, a generator for them. And it also defines a uh, a language for, for describing your assertions. And often it's basically uh, Boolean expressions, but there's some, some nice little stuff that you can put, put in there too. And this is basically what I'm going to, I'm not going to talk more about property-based testing and traditional Scala check uh, testing uh, today. <laughs> so if you want to know more, you can, you can buy the book that's <laughs> out just, uh, just the other day. Oh. Yeah, I, I think I skipped over. Yeah, I skipped over describing the, the different parts of this pre presentation. Yeah, so first we had the, the intro, and uh, now we will get to, uh, to a presentation of a uh, a new API that I have implemented on top of Scholarship that lets you, you test stateful systems, uh, but still do it in a property-based fashion, so to speak. And the ending part will present two examples, uh, a bit more real world uh, than what you will see in, in part two. So we go to part. And I have some disclaimers. All, all the code I present here uh, works with, uh, with the latest sna snapshot version of Scholarship. So this is not in, in, uh, in a real release yet. And the implementation is heavily inspired by, by the QuickCheck implementation for Erlang. And I really encourage you to, to take a look at these two presentations where they where they test the uh, level DB and uh, and RIAC using the same technique that I will show here, but they do it with with uh, QuickCheck for Erlang. It's really it, re it really shows the point of um, of uh, why this is a, a useful way of testing things. So, if we would like to write a property that that test that specifies a database. How would we do that? I mean, the contents of a database are the result of a, a sequence of state mutating commands. Uh, so we we really can't say 
say something uh, without taking all those uh, commands uh, into account. So for ordinary properties, Scholarship, as I said, generates uh, random inputs and uh, evaluates a, an expression. It would be nice if we could, for stateful system, let the input be a sequence of commands and let Scholarship evaluate post conditions for each command and in that way verify that the system behave, that the commands of the system behaves as we want. So can we wrap this up in a simple model that Scholarship can understand? And that's it's what I have tried to do and that is what I will present here. So the simplest possible model to, to, to model a command is, is probably this. Uh, a command can run something and it can tell you if it succeeded. Okay. So let's see if we can uh, uh, test the, the simplest possible stateful system that I could come up with, which, which is a simple counter which have uh, which has two methods, increment and get. So if we want to define a command that models the increment command of the system, uh, we run into problems because, yeah, we can, we can execute the, the increment command on the, on the system and we get something back, but, but we can't verify that because we don't know what the system looked like before and what, what we can expect from it. So we need something more. We need to, in, uh, to introduce an, a state that we, can, uh, that we can use to represent the real state of the system and use it in our models. So uh, in this case, our state is just uh, a long value which represents the value of uh, the current value of the counter. And now the command uh, model gets a bit more complex. It, it takes the state, uh, the run method will take the state, and now we can actually verify that what we get back from the real system, my counter, uh, makes sense uh, with the current state. And we also need, need to, to create a new version of the state so that the, the next, next commands will have a new version, an updated state version to check against. So this is very basic for, for our counter. We just, we just increment the state. Now in, in ScalaCheck there's, there's some more to, to this model, but this is mainly to, to, for convenience. Uh, we introduce a type for the system under test, a SAT type. Uh, and th this makes it easy for ScalaCheck to, to handle several systems uh, under test at the same time, to sort of run parallel t tests against several systems. And the run method now takes the, the system under test as a parameter, and I have also moved the the post condition to its own method, so we don't do the checking in the run method, we do it in a separate method, because it, it makes sense to, to divide this into two parts. And I also added a precondition uh, method to the command. If you have a precondition that you're not allowed to run this command if you're in a certain state, then you can state it here. Then there's also some more parts to make this work. Um, we need to be able to create a, a, new, a new system under test, uh, given a state. We, we need to be able to tear it down. We need to generate an initial state and also generate commands. And both these uh, generator methods use the, the, the ordinary ScalaCheck generators to create uh, state instances and command instances. And this will get a bit clearer if we show how our counter specification could look like. 
So now our, our system under test type is just the, the counter class. Uh, the state is long and these methods are not that interesting, but we create a new counter with the, the current value and the generate command returns either an increment command or a get command. And this command looks like this. And the, it's pretty basic. It, we, the run command just, just executes, executes the, the increment method in this case. And uh, the next state in, uh, increments our model of the state. And we don't have a precondition, so we just return true. And we check that we want to get back uh, the current state plus one if this command is executed. And ScalaCheck also wraps the, the run method in a try type. So it, it, can, it catches exceptions, so we can actually test for, test, have negative tests here. If we, we want a certain command to trigger an exception for some value, then we can try that we get a, then we can check that we get a failure back, and we can also check the exception type if, if we want that. The get com command is not that difficult either. Now we don't do anything to the state because the get command shouldn't affect the state in any way. And we just want to get the current value back if this is ex executed. So, with all this in, in place, ScalaCheck can generate, can create a property, a, a plain ScalaCheck property out of this model and it is done with the, the property method, method of, the, of the command straight. And this property will, on each evaluation, create a new system under test object and then generate a random sequence of commands and execute it and verify each post conditions on the, on the real system. Yeah, so, so we get this counter prop and we can check it like any scholar check property and it fails. And, and the reason is uh, quite simple. We, we try to increment uh, the, the max value of, of the integer type and then it rolls over and we get a negative number instead. And we can, in this example, see that ScalaCheck's simplification feature that sim tries to minimize failing test cases works also for the commands case. So we can see that the, the original argument was, was uh, an initial state of the max int and then an increment and an increment get, the increment get, get, the increment. But in the end, Scala, ScalaCheck simplified it and noticed that if I just run increment on this initial state, it will trigger the same error. So we are presented with just a minimal uh, command sequence. Okay, so this is good, but how do we solve it? We can either just add a precondition. Okay, you are not allowed to, to run the increment command if, if the current state is, is in that max value, uh, or we can choose to throw an exception. So in this case, we changed our implementation to throw an exception, and then we also have to change our specification, uh, and we have to change both the next state method because it will not update the state if it is called, uh, if, if the current state has reached the max. And the post condition is also changed to expect a failure if, if, um, if it is executed when the, the max value is reached. And both of these solutions fixes th this problem. And we can uh, check the, the property 
Uh, and by default, it checks it 100 times, which means it will generate 100 different sequences of commands and uh, generate and run, uh, create 100 different system instances and test these commands against. Okay, now we can add a parameter to, to our property function. So, so we don't change anything in the, in the model or specif specification. We just create the property with, with this thread count set to three and check it again. Ouch, now we failed again. And this is very messy, but if we, if we just count the number of, uh, number of times increment has been called here, we'll find it, it has been called 17 times. But the highest val value ever returned is 16. So there's, there's something wrong here. And it's not that difficult to see because uh, we have a race condition in our increment method. And yeah, what, what happened here? The thing is, when you, you increase the thread count of, of, of Scala check here, it will divide the testing into two parts. It will first run an ordinary sequential uh, phase where, where it will run a number of commands against the system and, and uh, verify the post condition for each, each command. But after that, it will run a, a parallel phase. And in our case, it will run three command sequences in parallel. And the thing is that while we're doing this, we can't check any post conditions because we don't know the real order of, of execution here. If you look at this beautiful picture. <laughs> this is, the, the arrows is just one possible order of, of execution. The only thing that will be maintained is that within we, each thread, uh, the, the commands will run sequentially. But otherwise, we, we, the threads could, could be, the commands from the different threads could be interleaved in any way with, with each other. But the thing is, we can actually, we can actually calculate each possible transformation from this by combining the, the, the different commands in every way. And since we have the, the state transformations in our commands, we can also get all possible end states for this mess. So, and we know that the last command that runs will either be, be get ink or ink in this picture, because the very last command that gets executed must be one of the last commands from, from, the, di from the different threads. So we can actually take all our computed end cases and match them with the, result, with, the, with the post conditions of all the possible last commands. And therefore, if, if we find a match, then we know that, okay, it, 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 was, prob it was possible to, to end, uh, if the commands ran, ran in this order, and then it was possible to end up with the state. But in, in In this test, there's no possible way for, for, the, 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 post, for, the, for the end state to, uh, I mean, the end state will end up uh, as 16, but there's no possible way to, uh, to fulfill the, the post conditions uh, for, uh, for that value.
So this is, I, sh I should also t tell you that this is sort of a proof of concept, but, but this parallel testing has, has been implemented, for example, in, the, in this quick check for Erlang, and it, and it, it seems to be working. Uh, but this is, of course, a toy project, and uh, it needs to be, to be used in more real-world uh, situation also. Okay, uh, so I will present two, two real-world uh, examples. Uh, although I don't, will not show the, I will not use the, this parallel testing. I will just show how to how to model commands uh, in the in the usual sequential way. So the first example is testing the database Redis. And if we want to test it, we can create a state that looks like this. It, it has uh, a contents that, that models the contents of the, of the database, which is just a key value store, a map. We also store all values, all keys that has been deleted, that has sometime existed in the database. And I will show you later uh, why we do that. We also uh, uh, model if we are connected to the database uh, or not. And our system under test is just a Redis client that can communicate with, uh, with the server. The get command is quite, quite simple. So we will, this Redis uh, client returns an option when, when uh, you call, when you try to get the value for a, for a key. So therefore our return type looks a bit messy. So our run method will just run the get method of the of the Redis client. Uh, our next state will just, will just return the same state since it, this won't change anything. And the post condition just expects that the return value will match the value we have in our map, in our state model. So basically here we rely on the, on the map implementation in, in our state to sort of model the Redis database because we match, we run the get on our, on our map and want, uh, want to make sure that it is uh, identical to the, the return value. And we also have a precondition that we must be connected to the database in order to run this method. And now the generator for this get command is I have divided on, on, uh, on some different generators. The first one will just try to get any key and it doesn't care about the current state. So it will try to get a random key uh, from the database and most most probably this key won't exist in the database. Then we have a get existing, we'll, which will try to get an existing key from the database. And finally we have a get deleted generator that will try to retrieve a key that has been in the database some time before. And this is interesting because we want to we want to we want the state to reflect uh, we want our version of the state to reflect the state of the system but we can add extra stuff to to our state if we suspect that oh this might be a problem i mean what if the delete command don't work correctly so that it leaves the key there then we want our get command to 
to sort of verify that they haven't been deleted. And the delete command is, is not that difficult either. It takes, a, uh, it takes a list of keys to delete, and that is basically because the Redis client that I'm using can delete, it also takes a list of keys. And it updates the state by removing the keys from the current contents and adding the keys to the deleted ones. And it, the post condition checks that the value that was returned from the Redis client del delete method, it, it will return the number of keys that was deleted. It checks that this number uh, is equal to the, the number of keys that existed in our, in our state. And yeah, as I said, it can make sense to model things that that aren't in the in the in the real state, so to speak. But but is a is a has to do with the history of the of the system state. And a technique for for uh, for gener for defining generators and commands is to define general command instances like this. This works for, this is a general delete command. It works for all situations, but then we have sort of specialized uh, generators. And of course, we have an, uh, a gen commands uh, implementation that, that picks at random one of, one of the, those generators. And I can run yeah, this, this example. I, I only show the delete and get uh, command, but I have an implementation where I test some different commands uh, from Redis, and it's available in, in Scholarship re Repository. And I can actually run. Uh, it's not that exciting, since it basically won't output anything. But I start a local Reddit server here. And then I, I test uh, my, uh, my uh, Redis property. And now I turn up the, the number of tests that Scholarship runs to, to 500 and I set the minimal size to 100 and the maximum size to 100, which means that it will re uh, run exactly 500 command sequences where, where each sequence is, is 100 commands long. So it does that now, and hopefully, this is kind of boring, but Hopefully we should get a result. Yeah, it passed. And uh, basically the only thing we can see is that Redis actually did something. Um, so I, I didn't manage to find any, any error in, in this subset of Redis commands. So. My next. No, this was not multi-threaded, no. So, no. Uh, my next uh, example is a bit more experimental, but it's, it seems to be working nicely. And uh, the idea is to, to sort of widen the, the idea of what a state is. So, what if we let the state be a complete network of, of servers? that probably would run some, some software that we would like to test. 
but in this example, I will just test the ping commands between the servers. Uh, and this is also implemented and, uh, and available as an example project in, in ScalaCheck. And now ScalaCheck was never really built to, to generate virtual machines. So I, I have used uh, something to, to help out with that. And there's a, a really, really nice uh, project called NixOS that is a, really a, a, a purely functional uh, language for building server deployments. Uh, basically, you can you can use it as a general build tool, but but Nix OS is a, is a Linux distribution that that uses this this Nix build tool to to, to build uh, configurations. So basically, this these three lines define is is one definition of a of a, of a complete server that basically say that. Yeah, I want to have the, the grub bootloader at uh, my first disk, and I want to mount my first partition as the root uh, on the root path, and I want to enable an SSH server. So basically, out of this, NixOS can build a complete a complete installation of a, of this Linux distribution, and it can activate it on your your computer, or it could build a virtual machine out of it. And this is a perfect fit for us, because this is a completely declarative way of building virtual machines. So what I have done is, is I have defined a, our, our state, and it is basically just a list of machines that is, take part, is part of the network. And a ma machine has some IDs, uh, it has an IP number, and just for demonstration, it has a kernel version and a mem amount of memory, and we also model if the machine is running or not. So we create a generator that can generate the machine, and uh, yeah, use the ScalaShex uh, ID generated, generated you, uh, to generate the unique ID. Uh, here I have hard coded my setup uh, for my laptop to, to, to match the virtual network I have, I have configured. So we generate an IP number uh, within the correct subnet. I generate a memory amount between 96 and 256 mem megabytes. I generate, I pick a kernel version. Okay. Now I need to have a, a system under test uh, type also. And uh, in this case, I've used the libvirt uh, library and the, and the Java bindings to that. So the system under test is simply just a map between the idea of a machine, because we need it for to be able to access the machines uh, to the libvirt uh, handle of the running virtual machine. And the SAT creator method, in this case, first sets up a connection to, to the libvirt uh, system, and then it uses this uh, method that I've implemented the, that takes the current state and creates uh, XML definitions that Librate can use to set up uh, its machines. Uh, and then it asks, uh, yeah, the Librate XML asks uh, Nix to build the machines for it. And this is basically the part where uh, I sort of inject the things from our state into the configuration of the individual machines. So here we could, here we could basically tweak any, any details of, of the machine we're running. If, if you just make a parameter for it in our model and inject it in the, in the Nix configuration in some way, but 
in our case, yeah, we, we set the memory size, we set the host name and the IP, and, and we pick a kernel package version to use. And then we have this quite hacky ping command defined that when it is run, runs, uh, actually runs SSH to the machine from where we want to ping. And on that machine, we run ping to, to the target machines. And so a, a, a ping command goes from one, from one machine to another machine. And the post condition says that the command should succeed if the target is, machine, is running, otherwise it should fail. And we have a precondition that said that the, the source machine must be running. And I have a demo for the, this too. Now, this is kind of slow, basically, mostly because I'm doing quite stupid things when, when setting up the IP numbers and waiting for each machine to be available. But uh, so therefore, I only run one test and set the the min size to to 20 and max size 20, which means that I will just run one sequence of commands. Uh, where this sequence will be 20 commands long. So what happens now is that ScalaCheck will first generate the state and then uh, by the help of Nix build all those machines. Uh, and after that it starts running commands and now it, has, it runs the, the first command that was, uh, yeah, I should say that uh, apart from the ping command we also have boot and shut down commands. So it, it boots up some, some of the computers here. <laughs> and then it shuts it down, which is kind of stupid. But then it does a ping between, it pings it, the, the 12 machine there, pings itself and it succeeds. Then the 12 machine tries to ping the one, two, three machine that hasn't been started yet and therefore we get a uh, package loss. And yeah, then it continues. Yeah, and it probably succeeds some time soon, but we don't have to wait for that. And so the, the interesting thing to note here is that this generated network could be, could be nodes in a distributed database or an actor system or really any, any system where you want to, to, to define the, the semantics. Uh, and, and because you can have the representation of, of the state uh, in, in Scala check and, and make sure that, that all commands on the real state, uh, real um, system behaves accordingly. And NixOS allows us sort of to, to model any component of the system. So maybe if your data system, uh, if your database depends on which file system you are using. Maybe it behaves strangely if you use the XFS file system. Just model the different file systems as a parameter of your machines. And ScalaCheck will generate different variants and combinations and, and try them together. Or you can test a new implementation of a, of a server against old clients or, yeah, ScalaCheck will sort of scramble things up and hopefully also use, use the, minimum, the simplification systems to sort of present, oh, this is the minimal system that would reproduce this error and so on. But this is 
very much proof of concept and quite hackily uh, implemented. Uh, but it's it's an interesting experiment, and I think there's interesting work to be done there and package some parts of it in in, in sub projects or, or or things like that. So to wrap up everything is that property-based testing can be more than just testing an, an immutable function and testing inputs and outputs. You can sort of, like I have done here, build a model on top of scholarship properties and, and sort of use ScholarCheck as an, as an engine and use its, its uh, generators and property definitions and stuff like that. But, but widen the, the scope of, of what is tested. And yeah, as I said, Skalashek and Nixo is, is an interesting fit that, that could be investigated further. Yeah, any questions? doing the multi-threaded testing on the counter, yeah. um, did you say that it would calculate what the final state of the system would be? Yeah, what the possible so final, final state. Okay, so you've got five increments there, so it would say the first value was six and now it should be 11. Yeah. And that's, that's so it. Yeah, so in this system, since we only have increment and get we will only end up with one possible final system. Okay. So uh, in this case, where these things were running, the, the final system should, the final state should be 17 because we ran increments 17 times and it doesn't matter how they are interleaved, they, will, uh, they should end up with 17. But in the general case, we could end up with, I mean, if we had, had uh, a reset method, it would, if you run that first, or if you uh, run that last, it, it, uh, depending on how it, it is interleaved with, with the other commands, it will affect the end state. So we sort of calcu calculate all possible end states and match it against the post conditions of all possible last commands. And what would happen if you had a decrement? How many possible end states would you have? Yeah, I mean, the possible end states are, uh, <laughs> they, it depends on how many threads you run in parallel and how long your, your, uh, your parallel sequences are. And there are limitations to what you can do and there are limitations in, in ScholarCheck on how many, how many steps it will do in, in parallel. Uh, you can sort of set an, uh, a limitation on, on, on yeah. Yep. Uh, so in the closure community, they've got um, a kind of their own version of quick check. And one of the experimental features they were doing was kind of along these lines, but um, well, because there's closure magic, they can in intercept the uh, thread related um, functions and then define their own scheduler kind of tied into the randomization that happens. Um, so essentially when, when you call the function to um, add some, something to the thread pool or I enclosure terms deal with atoms and agents and so on, then it says I'm now the scheduler and I'll decide exactly when you get to run and thus decide exactly how the interleavings happen and thus force more interleavings to happen. Because I guess here this is great but you're at the mercy of the kind of the, the OS, or the, yeah, sort of the scheduling yeah. that goes on in yeah. JVM. Yeah. So you, you hope that if you run it enough times, you'll kind of hit some interesting case. Yeah. Um, it would be great if we could do that for Scala. I just have no idea how we could <laughs> no, but this mess with the um, with the underlying threading routines. I mean, it, this is sort of an experiment, and this is definitely something that 
you could investigate further and see how useful it is in, in practice and also see if you can do things like that because I have also been thinking of yeah that you could sort of um, yeah, trigger more more uh, interleavings to occur but, yep. so can I be cheeky and ask a second question <laughs> um, so the, a point on on the tests that take a really long time to run like so the uh, the next OS the, the the networking thing you, you talked about the um, the shrinking. Um, presumably, the shrinking is also going to take yeah. quite a long time yeah, to run absolutely. as well. Okay. Did you have any ideas about how to kind of Im improve the the speed of the shrinking, or is there any shortcuts you can do? Or is there really nothing in general? I mean, the speed of the shrinking depends on that it, it has to rerun the whole. It has right. to come up with a new sequence of commands and then rerun this from from scratch. I mean, and recreate the machines and do everything. And then, oh, uh, it didn't fail here, or it's still, uh, and it will, the shrinking will sort of gradually make things smaller. And I think in, in the comments uh, API, the, it, it might make sense to, to use some Simple, some shrinker that don't try as many variants or something, but yeah, that is also something that could be investigated. Yeah. Thank you. Um, maybe my question is kind of related, but um, would it be a good thing to test if you want to do more gets, uh, sorry, more increments than decrements, for example, or you are more or less right oriented. Uh, I don't know if I'm making sense. I mean, yeah, so, uh, uh, so let's say let's say you have increments and decrements, yeah. but your system is more tuned to be incremented. Of course, in the end, we are just looking for correctness, but still, perhaps that makes a difference too. Yeah, to I, I mean, we we can freely decide how we generate the commands, and I can actually. if we have time show how the generator for this uh, Nix uh, system works so we can here I use the, the frequency combinator mm -hmm. to generate more more pings than than shutdowns and, and boots so we I mean we can tweak the generators if that's yeah, so that would be like you try and do more increments and decrements, yeah. or yeah. more decrements. Yeah, and I mean, and, and it could depend on your state, you, because the uh, the yen command takes the state. So maybe if you can look at your state and say that we should run more type, more kinds of these these kinds of commands, or more. Yeah. Yeah, at the beginning or at the end mm. or, or something like that. That's excellent. Thank you. Mm.